Temple, and we've been exceptionally fortunate that over the years of the Templeton Lecture, uh, we have uh, been able to bring to this audience uh, most of the people in that field who have something sensible to say and who have insights into uh, both sides of it. And tonight is uh, certainly uh, no exception with uh, Rabbi David Rosen. You have, of course, in front of you something of his, uh, of his uh, achievements, and I'll just say a few. He was born in Britain and educated there. He received his ordination in Israel. He did military service in the Israeli Defense Force Armored Corps, and no doubt he found his experience there uh, very useful for his next two positions, uh, senior rabbi of the largest congregation in South Africa and chief rabbi of, uh, of Ireland. When he returned to Israel after the uh, Ireland uh, post, uh, he served as dean for the Sapir Center for Jewish Education and Culture. He was a member of the Bilateral Commission of the State of Israel in the relationship with the Holy See, and in that capacity worked on the ground, uh, the uh, enormous achievement uh, when the Vatican did recognize uh, the, the State of Israel. Most recently, he's been the, and I think you still are, the International Director of the Interreligious Affairs of the American Jewish Committee. And uh, I just learned today that uh, Rabbi Rosen is the newly minted president of the International Jewish Institute for Interreligious Consultations. And also, the, for those of you not familiar with the arcana of, of uh, Jewish organizations, uh, this is the equivalent of being president of the president's organizations. All those Jewish organizations that have some kind of interreligious discussions have come together in a group, and Rabbi Rosen is now the president of it. Uh, in the Navy, you would say that he's put himself in harm's way <laughs> with, with these posts, but we, ex we expect great things. Over the course of the years, as you might imagine, all of these activities have made him quite familiar with uh, air travel. And he indeed uh, spent so much time on an airplane that one of his daughters quipped that he, she thought often of her father in heaven, uh, but she did not mean the Almighty. <laughs> on top of all this, Rabbi Rosen comes to us with a special distinction. He is the tenth of the Templeton speakers. And those of you who may be familiar with uh, Jewish practice know that a quorum of ten is the basic unit uh, for a spiritual community. And so Rabbi Rosen today qualifies for the legendary 10th man uh, of Jewish uh, religious lore, having made what is in Hebrew called the minion, the count. Uh, thus, with all of these things going for him, we're delighted to have him this afternoon. And with no further ado, I'd like to turn the podium over to Rabbi Rosen, who will talk to us about religion, identity, and peace in the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sickerman, and to you all for the kind invitation to give this illustrious address, especially to Jack and Pina Templeton, whom I think are probably directly responsible for my presence here this afternoon. Um, Apropos being the 10th, I'm reminded of the story, you know, sometimes in little Jewish towns, when they needed a quorum, not everybody was available for prayer time, especially if they were praying three times a day. So sometimes a person was paid in order to make sure that he would be there as the 10th man. And they would often refer to somebody as a minion man, because uh, minion is meaning the quorum. So he was the man who would make up the 10 in the synagogue. And the story is told of a man who comes to court to testify in a case. And the judge says, give us your name and your profession. He says, my name is Abraham Levine, and I'm a minion man. And the judge says, what's a minion man? And the man says, well, your honor, when there are nine, I come, and there are ten. The judge says, if there are nine and I come, there are also ten. He says, you're also Jewish. Oh, welcome. <laughs> Okay, I much prefer actually to tell you jokes, but that's not what I've been asked to come for this evening. And um, I would uh, like to tell you about certain initiatives and developments in the Middle East at what I think are very momentous times where there are unique opportunities 
that very often in the course of the hustle and bustle of ongoing activities are not only not known, but are often um, so sheltered from the public view that I think people often get a distorted perspective on reality. So I would like to tell you about some of these and where I think in particular um, this process should go and to some extent give it a little bit of a theoretical or a little more theoretical context to place these developments in. While it's true that most conflicts that are portrayed in religious conflicts as in the world are, are nothing of the sort, whether we are talking about conflicts between Hindus and Muslims in Kashmir, or Buddhists and Hindus in Sri Lanka, Christians and Muslims in Nigeria or Indonesia, Protestant and Catholics in Northern Ireland, or between Muslims and Jews in the Middle East. These conflicts are, of course, not at all religious conflicts in their origin. They don't have any theological basis for the conflict, at least their origins are not in any theological basis. They are all territorial conflicts in which ethnic and religious differences are exploited and manipulated, often mercilessly. However, this fact still begs the question, why and how is it that religion is so easily exploited and abused? Why is it that in so many contexts of conflict in our world, religion appears to be more part of the problem than the solution? The answer, I believe, to a large extent is to be found precisely in the socio-cultural, territorial and political contexts to which I referred, in which these conflicts take place. Because religion seeks to give meaning to our understanding of who we are, it is inextricably bound up with all the components of human identity, with the circles within circles that make us who we are. It seeks to give meaning to who I am as an individual, who I am as part of a family, who I am as part of a community, who I am as part of a nation, who I am as part of the wider humanity. So it's bound up with all these different circles of human identity. These components, of course, of human identity are the building blocks upon which our psycho-spiritual and psychological uh, and, uh, and inner security and stability depend. And we ignore them at our peril. Those that think that the solution to conflict is to eliminate elements of identity have been in for a rude shock. And we can see the consequences of that, especially in modern society, with a vengeance. And perhaps that word is, has a double meaning. Indeed, the importance of identity has been emphasized by both scholarly and popular writers on the human condition that have suggested that much of the counterculture in modern society and problems of drug abuse and of violence and of cults, etc., are in fact a search for identity and meaning on the part of those who are deracinated, who lack a certain stability, security in their identity, who are no longer con connected with these components of identity that we took for granted so much in the past. But in the relationship between religion and identity, the components or circles within circles of our identity affirm whom we are, but they also affirm whom we are not. Their function, whether as positive components determining how we relate to others or negative in terms of how we relate to others, depends substantially upon the context that we find or in which we perceive ourselves to be. Some of you will recall the popular novelist of a few decades ago, Robert Ardrey, who in his book, The Territorial Imperative, referred to three essential components, needs of the human being, security, stimulation, and identity. And he pointed out that the absence of security provides the stimulation that guarantees identity. That when you have plenty of security, then very often you have a loss of identity. But when you have a situation of conflict, like in war, then you don't have problems of identity. People's identities are in fact reinforced by conflict, which is problematic. Moreover, because religion is so inextricably bound up with these components of identity, then in conflict, religion tends more often than not to be part and parcel of this reaction, of this withdrawal, of this often insular 
mentality rather than providing an embrace in which individuals are able to relate positively to those outside their community. We might note in parenthesis that the great prophets of Israel, if we read our Bible, have two different roles. The one role is to challenge society, to live up to its moral responsibilities and to the ethical vision that the Bible lays down. However, this challenge of the people, often with extremely strong language, is always and only when the people are living what we may say is securely in the land. When the people are in exile, the prophets do not assume the role as chastisers of rebuking the people for their failure to live up to moral ideals because the people are in a vulnerable situation. Their security and stability is threatened. And under those circumstances, as opposed to the first where the classic example would be Amos, other circumstances, like with Ezekiel, the prophet sees his role to nurture the needs of the community, to strengthen their identity, to give them hope, and therefore to be with the people, not essentially to rebuke them. The problem, however, is that when we are in situations of insecurity and instability, and when we are in situations of conflict, the nurturing that is necessary to preserve us often comes together with a sense, with a mentality that in order to strengthen our own resolve tends to be self-righteous, insular, and often demonizing of the other. In order to strengthen our sense of our own virtue and of our own legitimacy, there is a tendency to deprecate the other often describing the other, as the historian Richard Hastader puts it, as a perfect model of malice. I find the image useful here to explain this concept that I've been discussing, the image of a spiral. These different components of identity, circles within circles, can spiral out and enrich society. Our identity as members, both individuals and members of families, can be a most wonderful blessing. Indeed, the family is, of course, the most crucial basic unit, social unit within society. Our identity as communities of worship, of devotion, of various kinds of solidarity can be wonderful blessings for society. If that sense of community in, in, inspires us, with a sense of responsibility for other communities and our society, uh, society at large, and so on and so forth. But those components of identity will open up and enrich the wider context if they feel secure in the wider context, if they feel welcome in the wider context, if they feel respected in the wider context. Then they will open up and they will enrich it. But if these components of identity feel threatened, unwelcome, and even in a hostile atmosphere, then what they do is they simply close up, and they close themselves off from the wider circle. And as I said, in closing themselves off, there is a tendency to denigrate, deprecate, and even demonize those who are not part of the group. What we call today, often technically incorrectly, fundamentalism, or extremism in the name of religion and often accompanied by violence is a reflection of this syndrome in which communities of one kind or another do not feel that they are part of the wider society. Whatever the reason is, and there are many reasons to explore it and to understand it, all forms of violence are a reflection of some kind of alienation. And when people are alienated and not welcome, then they will find ways both to justify their own validity, and generally to denigrate the others. We all know the proximity of the relationship between the insecurity and the superiority complex. In the Middle East, this phenomenon is in many respects particularly acute, though I would think that there are many other places that are very similar. The important point to bear in mind when looking at the Middle East conflict, looking at the conflict in the Holy Land and in the region, is to understand that everybody involved in this conflict sees themselves as a victim. And everybody sees themselves as vulnerable. They just see themselves in different paradigms. Palestinians see themselves as vulnerable in the face of Israeli military might and political power. 
Israel sees itself as vulnerable in the face of a sea of Arab hostility in which often Palestinian society is presented simply as a fifth column. The Arab world sees itself as insecure in the face of Western power, globalization, consumer, dynamism, all these other factors, however they want to, pre want to portray it. So we're in a situation of where, because everybody feels vulnerable in a different paradigm, the capacity to reach out is very often undermined. And in these contexts, religion tends to play a nurturing role, often to the point of exclusivity, instead of opening up and enabling us to embrace the other and to be able to see what all our religions teach, the fundamental common humanity of each and every one of us. So this, in a way, is even more acute within the Middle East because religion in our part of the world is not really prophetic. This is an embarrassing uh, um, truth to have to confess to you, but religion in our part of the world does not have a prophetic spirit of challenging the institutions of which it is a part precisely for the reasons that I've mentioned before. But this is compounded by the fact that the Muslim and Jewish institutions of religious authority are subject to the political authorities and even appointed by them. Situational Christianity in our part of the world is a little bit better. And generally speaking, the churches have wisely avoided being in, in any formal institutional pocket, but they can't av avoid it entirely. And because they are so vulnerable, caught, as it were, in a double minority situation, they too tend to be caught up by the politicization uh, of the, the conflict uh, as it affects their own religious message. So because religion has been increasingly associated with a more insular approach within the different communities, and because as a result of that insularity relating to identity where identity feels threatened, therefore often becoming violent and religion even supporting such violence, there's been a tendency on the part of political leadership that have sought to bring an end to the conflict in the Middle East. In other words, those initiating peace processes to keep far away from religion. The attitude has been simple and was referred to in the introduction of our president this evening. The attitude is that religion is part of the problem. Therefore, let's keep far away from it and keep them far out of the picture. I would even suggest that this mentality was dominant in the Oslo process and was one of the reasons for its failure. Because it is a total fallacy to think that you can keep religion out of the picture when it is so inextricably bound up with the identities of the communities involved in the context of conflict. If you don't want religion to be part of the problem, you have to make it part of the solution. On the lawn of the White House, and that famous handshake in 1993, is that right? I think so. You saw no identifiable religious figure on the lawn of the White House from Israel or from amongst Palestinian society. The message was clear. You religious figures, religious institutions, keep out of it. In fact, the implied message was that this process, the Oslo process, was at variance with the interests of the religious communities, which only reinforced the hostility within the most fervent segments of both the Muslim and Jewish society, not that I'm saying there's any equivalence here, mutatis mutandis, but within both societies of hostility towards the process. And both sides, in their own way, did their best to bring it down whether it was the continuing suicide bombings and carnage within Israeli society by Hamas, or whether it was the assassination of innocent Muslim worshippers at prayer by Baruch Goldstein, or the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin by Yigal Amir. All those elements that had a hand in bringing down the peace process did so out of a conviction that their religion required them to do so and that this process was hostile to the interests of their religious tradition. Now, I'm not saying that you can guarantee in any way that you can eliminate this abuse and distortion of religion. In fact, I've suggested that it's so inextricably bound up with a psychological condition of alienation and of vulnerability that it's probably impossible to alienate it. But you can neutralize it. You can counterbalance it. 
You can give the forces of positive religion and of the constructive use of religion enough exposure and enough support that you can counterbalance and even neutralize the impact of the extremists. If you don't want religion to be part of the problem, if you don't want the extremists to carry the day, then you have to strengthen the voice in the hands of the moderates. That was what political structures failed to do. In the last five years, the situation in a way has become even more acute in our part of the world because the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians or the Israel-Arab conflict as it was is essentially a territorial conflict, as I said right at the beginning. For obvious example, Nasser and Ben-Gurion did not go to war over their theological views of the world. They went to war over their own territorial interests. And generally speaking, throughout most of the history of this conflict, it has been understood as a territorial conflict. What has happened within the last five years has been a very dangerous development if I may use a bad English word, in other words, a non-existent English word, but you'll understand what I mean, the territorial conflict has been religionized. And this is a very dangerous development. If you talk to Palestinian Muslims, you will find increasingly a perception today that they view Israel's approach as one of ill intent towards Muslim holy sites. They believe, as a result of this internal propaganda, that the holy sites of Islam on the Temple Mount are in jeopardy. In fact, if Israel's leaders would have been a little more familiar with some of the writings and propaganda of Hamas, they might not have opened that tunnel, at least not done it in the way they did, that led to the violence at the time under the premiership of Bibi Netanyahu. But on the other side, Israelis are increasingly convinced that within Palestinian society, there is an unwillingness to recognize and respect the bond and the connection between the Jewish people and its holy sites and its ancestral bond with the land and specifically with Jerusalem. And in fact, people like Arafat played into this, even dismissing the idea that there even was a temple in that particular location. Barak at the time gave a very good riposte and asked where he thought that the tables of the money changers were that Jesus turned over. But the result is that you have a mutual use, a perception that religion is being used to undermine the place of the other. The fact that these five years, or the last five years, until in fact the death of Arafat, were known as the Al-Aqsa Intifada, the Intifada for the Holy Sites, of the mosque on the Temple Mount is a reflection of that. This is a very dangerous development because if it's a territorial conflict, we can solve it through territorial compromise. But once it's portrayed as a religious conflict between the godly and the godless, then there's no end to the bloodshed. As a result, I think that there is a dawning recognition of uh, what Doug Johnson refers to as religion as the missing art of statecraft that you cannot ignore the religious dimension. It was because of this that a remarkable historic initiative took place three years ago. As I said at the time, it was almost impossible to get religious leaders, the official institutional religious leadership within the Holy Land to be able to come together because each one felt threatened and vulnerable by the positions of the other. And therefore, in order to be able to use religion constructively, it often, invariably, requires a third party. In this case, the third party, providentially, was the Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord George Carey, who took the initiative to be able to bring the religious leaders of the Holy Land together. And again, providentially, Canterbury had a relationship with Al-Azhar, the most important institute of Islamic learning in the Arab world, perhaps in the Muslim world as a whole. This was particularly important because while the chief rabbis of Israel don't represent even all of Jews of Israel, certainly don't, let alone in the world, and while the patriarchs of Jerusalem do not represent all of Christendom, even in the Holy Land, let alone in the world, no Jew or Christian would have a problem 
if the chief rabbis or the patriarchs are representing their religious traditions for the purpose of coming to some peaceful recognition and accord that would be to the advantage of their respective communities. But in the case of the Muslim community, the Mufti of Jerusalem or the head of the Sharia courts as the most important chief justice within Palestinian Muslim society cannot speak on behalf of Islam. In fact, while I have no brief for Arafat, who I think was a very dis duplicitous, double-dealing individual, one of the true things that he did say at Camp David to both Clinton and Barak was in effect, I cannot deliver on Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not simply a Muslim, uh, not simply a Palestinian issue. It is a Muslim issue. And beyond that, and I'll come back to Jerusalem in a moment, but beyond that, there is nobody of stature within Palestinian Islamic society that can speak on behalf of Islam. And therefore, for any kind of encounter bringing the religious leaders together in order to issue a statement on behalf of peace and against violence and encouraging their communities to live in mutual respect with one another, it was essential to have a major Muslim figure host that gathering. The local Palestinians could not succeed, could, did not have the status, do not have the status to be able to achieve that on their own. And as I said, providentially, Canterbury had a relationship with Al-Azhar. Lord Carey turned to Sheikh Tantawi, the head of Al-Azhar. And unquestionably, the impact of September the 11th, 2001, played a part here. Now, for the first time, political leaders realized that they had to stand up and be seen to be on the side of good religion as opposed to the side of the abuse and the evil abuse of religion. And therefore, Mubarak, who would have nothing to do with religious institutions previously, gave the green light, the president of Egypt, gave the green light to Sheikh Tantawi, the head of Al-Azhar, to host this gathering. And it was an amazing gathering. First of all, the most mind-boggling aspect is that this was the first time in history that the religious leaders of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism in the Holy Land had ever come together. That's both pathetic and wonderful. It's pathetic that it had never happened before. It was wonderful that we succeeded in doing it. And we all came together, five rabbis, uh, including the chief rabbis, and maybe, in fact, we were six, and the patriarchs of Jerusalem, and the head of the Sharia courts, and a direct representative, a minister religious of, uh, of uh, a religious figure from Hebron who had been mandated by the Palestinian Authority to be its official representative for, for, for this gathering. And we all came together in the city of Alexandria, and the wonderful center that actually was the palace of King Farouk, which was self-contained and a very lovely setting for our gathering. And we issued a very important declaration, this Alexandria Declaration, which, as I said, condemned violence in the name of religion as the desecration of religion, called for peace and reconciliation, to educate our respective communities, to live in mutual respect for one another. And while violence did continue, and this event did not bring about an end to the ongoing violence in the Middle East, it was extremely important in terms of a testimony of what role religion should play and of the alternative way in which religion should be presented and should be brought in for constructive use. There have been a number of very important spin-offs from this Alexandria initiative. Now we have formulated the first ever council of religious institutions of the Holy Land. It involved the chief rabbinate. I serve as an advisor to the chief rabbis of Israel in this, and I'm also part of their delegation. Also, in, they have also a committee for interreligious dialogue with other faith communities, of which I'm part. We have the supreme courts of the Palestinian Authority, which are the most important Muslim figures. And we have all the patriarchs and the bishops of the Holy Land as part of this gathering. And the purpose of this council is threefold. First of all, to keep, maintain avenues of communication between religious leadership. Secondly, to be able to speak out as a joint body whenever there is abuse or misrepresentation of any one of the three religions. And finally, to be able to play a role if there is the will of political leadership to be able to use religion as a force to strengthen it. I referred earlier to the question of Jerusalem. It seems to me now, especially in the light of the last five years and the 
Now here's another bad use of English. Jerusalemization of the conflict. That popular wisdom that used to claim that Jerusalem needs to be left to the end of any political process of negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians is now passé entirely and is no longer relevant. On the contrary, today we have to address Jerusalem and take the bull by the horns as the key to be able to facilitate the psychological breakthrough that can enable communities to live together in mutual respect. In order to do so, as I already explained before, we can't just do it through this council. Because as I indicated, while the Jewish and Christian sides of this council might be adequate, the Muslim side is not. To get any accord on the question of Jerusalem that would simply affirm that we respect the holy sites of each other, that we call on our faithful not to desecrate or in any way jeopardize the sites of others, and to affirm a desire to live in mutual respect, something which I indicated before cannot be taken now for granted because of the propaganda that has been present and has so much poisoned the atmosphere in the course of the last five years, is more critical than ever before. I believe it can be done. In order to do so, however, we have to work on a much broader level of international political um, initiative because to speak on behalf of the Muslim world, the Palestinians need the additional presence of Jordan, which still claims to have and still does have a special role on the Temple Mount. It, in fact, pays the salaries of religious workers on the Temple Mount. Egypt, because of Egypt's prominence in the Arab world and because of Al-Azhar. Morocco, because the King of Morocco is the chairman of the Jerusalem Committee of the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Countries. And Saudi Arabia, ideally. Not just because the Saudis think that they are the guardians of all the Muslim holy sites, but because if the Saudis are in, then everybody else will be in, precisely because everybody else doesn't like them. And if they're out, they can be spoilers. So we need all those five elements in. And I'm giving you a scoop. We'll have to see within another, if you look out to see what developments happen within the course of the next year, there is an initiative underway that has already come quite a distance to bring the religious institutions together and the leadership together to be able to issue a declaration on Jerusalem and holy sites that would affirm mutual respect and provide also for the establishment of an interfaith regimen for Jerusalem. Let me conclude by reiterating what has been implicit in what I have said. Religion itself in the Middle East conflict cannot bring about a political breakthrough. Because religion is so wrapped up with the identities, and because the identities all feel under siege, and because they are overwhelmingly subject to political authority, if there is no will, political will, on the part of the respective leaderships, then religion cannot by itself bring about any resolution of a conflict. But if religion is not part of a process, then the process will not succeed. For any political process in the Middle East to succeed in resolving the conflict, it has to take religion seriously into account. And it is the religious dimension that can provide the psycho-spiritual glue that enables political processes to hold together. So my final sentence is, if we don't want religion to be part of the problem, it has to be part of the solution. The day seems to be coming where this understanding is dawning within political circles. And I hope that within the near future you will see something even greater than the Alexandria event in which religion will be used in a constructive way for the betterment of all the faith communities who both live in Jerusalem and the Middle East and who hold it dear. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Rosen, and now we'll entertain questions. The usual rules apply. If you have a question, ask it. If you have a speech, don't give it. <laughs> Please uh, step up to the microphone here, and uh, that way we'll be able to record you for posterity. The 
with all you have said, could you now give us your suggestions as to who should do what to ease the tensions and lead us toward resolution? And do you think the Gaza pullback is a good idea and should be followed by others? Okay, so you're asking me actually to step aside a little bit from the area of my presentation, which was focusing primarily on the role of religion, acknowledging that it's secondary to the political authority, but an essential handmaiden. And you're asking me to address specifically the political aspect. There is no question that the disengagement from Gaza has not just been a Rubicon that Israel has crossed, a historic event, but it has completely reorganized, re, um, it has caused the parties both locally and internationally to review the way they look at the conflict. There is no question that despite what might be officially said by certain Arab leaders, they were enormously impressed by the pullout from Gaza. And its impact and the way the Israeli soldiers behaved and the way they saw the police and the discipline was, had a, a very uh, significant uh, resonance even within Arab society, let alone internationally. But this is the first time ever that Israel has initiated a policy that not only leads to the uprooting of settlements in Gaza, but also in the West Bank. And this means that what has been done by Ariel Sharon is a statement that the concept of the idea of greater Israel, biblical Israel, settlement in the land, indeed, as I believe, mandated by God to the Jewish people, is not not realizable in practical, political, economic, demographic, and moral terms. And that, in my opinion, again speaking as a religious individual, is the right religious decision. What he has done has, in fact, is to shatter a dangerous neo-messianic perception that says, forget about demographic and economic and political and moral considerations, we know what God wants. We know the divine agenda. And we can read it in scripture and tell you the way it's going to unfold. When somebody presumes to know exactly the mind of God and how that is going to unfold and needs to unfold in political terms, one needs to be very, very wary of such an individual or such a group. Such an approach generally is catastrophic for society. And if we would have continued to allow this to determine Israeli policy as it did for many years, it could have brought about the end of the Zionist enterprise. So in my opinion, what Ariel Sharon did was not just a wise political decision. It was a decision that was essential to guarantee the survival of the Jewish state and to guarantee that we can maintain both a state in which there is a Jewish majority and therefore can be called a Jewish state and at the same time is a democracy. But to have tried to have hold on, and even to try to hold on now to the whole of the West Bank, is to overextend ourselves. We have to cut our cloth to suit our size. And therefore, the need to be able to find an accommodation of a two-state solution is not just a matter of being nice to the Palestinians and recognize a legitimate aspiration for national self-determination, all of which I'm in favor of. It is an imperative for Israel's own well-being and for guaranteeing its future and its stability. Rabbi Rosen, thank you for a really wonderful talk. Um, two questions in the, your list of uh, Arab countries that needed to be involved in the solution. You left out a, a non-Arab country, Iran, and I wonder whether you think that they could be a, a spoiler of significance to a solution there. And secondly, would you say a little more about the interfaith regiments, what that means, please? Um. There are all kinds of different tensions within the Muslim world. And you can see at the moment in Iraq that, there are some, that there's some terrible behavior and terrible catastrophic taking of life as a result of tensions between Shias and Sunnis. 
Obviously, in any grand finale, the like of which I was fantasizing about, it would be important to have major sheer personalities there. And probably the most important Shia personality in the world today is in Iraq, and that's who has acquired much more prominence many people didn't know about him before, and that's Sheikh Ali al-Sistani. And therefore, I think it's true that it's important to have a Shia uh, leadership present. But what perhaps I didn't clarify in this initiative on Jerusalem is that what we're looking for here is a gathering of religious leadership, the political players are important to facilitate the presence of the religious leadership. But we're not talking of a gathering of political leaders. And therefore, if we can have major Shia leadership, then I don't see Iran as being a spoiler. Also, at this time, paradoxically, Saudi Arabia is more flexible than Iran at this moment in time. Saudi Arabia, as you know, even suggested it's willing to establish full normal relations with Israel if Israel is willing to go back to the borders which Abba Iban described as the borders of suicide, and pre-67 borders. But the very fact that Saudi Arabia is willing to talk of the possibility of an accommodation shows a significant change there. Iran is still far from that. Iran's position is still committed totally to Israel's destruction. Therefore, I don't think there's any possibility that we would be able to get Iran on that, in uh, to support major leadership from Iran. But as I say, I don't think it's too uh, problematic as long as in the finale, when all the Muslim figures are there, we have major Shiite personalities as well. Um, with regards to a regimen for Jerusalem, what, uh, what I mean by this is a modus operandi of interreligious cooperation that we would have a structure by which Christian, Muslim, and Jewish authorities would cooperate, both in terms of the communication that I mentioned before, both in terms of fighting defamation and misrepresentation I mentioned before, but also in terms of way they can cooperate of mutual interests, areas that relate for protection of holy sites, areas that might relate to tourism, uh, areas uh, in terms of relationship between the authorities and defining autonomy for religious institutions. Um, the specifics are less important than creating a dynamic in which the three communities feel that they are working together. Perhaps one of the most important areas could relate to the whole question of world heritage sites and ensuring that financial resources to develop major religious sites in Jerusalem is channeled through an interreligious committee so that everybody has an interest in working with the other in order to be able to promote their own requirements. Any framework that can encourage practical cooperation and not simply theoretical dialogue will be, I believe, a blessing for Jerusalem. So that's what I meant by regimen. Uh, Rabbi Rosen, uh, if religion doesn't want to be the uh, problem but part of the solution, what, if anything, can American groups who are involved in a religious dialogue and American religious leaders do to be part of the solution instead of the part of the problem? Um, obviously, the spectrum is much broader than the way I have addressed it this evening. I've gone on something very specific. The Alexandria Summit, the Alexandria Declaration, direct spin-off, which would be a declaration on Jerusalem and the holy sites that would have direct impact. But something that people don't know, and is very important that in America it's more widely known, is that there is an enormous amount of interreligious activity in the Holy Land. When I say that the institutions of religious authority are not prophetic, and generally speaking I think that's a fair comment, that doesn't mean that there aren't prophets around in the Holy Land. There are lots of wonderful people who are doing very important things in the area of interreligious cooperation and who actually embody the prophetic spirit. Uh, we have an interreligious coordinating council, which the American Jewish Committee was also one of the founders, that bring together in Israel 70, 70 different organizations working in the field of interreligious dialogue and cooperation. 
The Abraham Fund, which some of you may know of, which is a philanthropic organization to help promote Arab-Jewish relations, lists 300 organizations in the Holy Land of cooperation between Arabs and Jews in the area of politics, philanthropy, law, human rights, and social initiatives of various kinds. So there's a wonderful amount of activity. What is really important for us who are engaged in that, and as Dr. Sukerman mentioned, uh, I'm less engaged in those areas in the Holy Land now than I used to be because I'm spending so much time gallivanting around the world pretending to be ambassador for Judaism to the religions of the world. But nevertheless, there are incredible initiatives there on the ground that promote those relationships between the different communities, which if American Jewry and American Christianity and American Islam really care about the well-being, should be supporting both human rights activities, both dialogue activities, especially those that bring Palestinians and Israelis together. One of the worst things that has been an inevitable byproduct and is a problem we still have to contend with, but it's, it's actually tragic in the American context, is the assumption very widespread that if you care about Palestinians, somehow you have to be hostile to Israel. Or that if you care for Israel's security, somehow you have to denigrate the Palestinians. This zero-sum mentality is bad for everyone. If you really care about any one side, then you need to adopt a win-win approach that seeks to be able to promote the welfare of both communities and especially cooperation and dialogue between both communities. There are also ways in which we can inform uh, American society. And you know that we have a number of different programs. One of perhaps the most relevant program to mention is one that I initiated about three years ago called Abrahamic Voices of Peace from the Holy Land. And we send out to America once or twice a year an imam, a Muslim leader, a rabbi, Israeli rabbi, and a Christian minister who Im invariably is an Arab as well, representing the local communities, to bring a message of peace and of cooperation and mutual respect to American society at large, both to be able to demonstrate that there are such initiatives, both to be able to shatter the stereotypes, and often to be able to neutralize the elephant in the room that is so often there in terms of Jewish Christian and other, and especially Jewish Muslim or Jewish Christian Muslim dialogue, where they can't even address the question of the Middle East without coming to blows or destroying the possibility of dialogue and of conversation. Having the presence of an imam as well as an Arab priest together with a rabbi showing mutual respect and conversing and giving their hopes and their vision for peace in the Middle East is a very powerful tool. So we need to spread that more. We've done a pretty good job in these three years. So the, we've had teams of different trios across most of the country. But I would say above all, what Americans need to do are to support those initiatives that promote mutual respect and cooperation in the Holy Land. Rabbi, thank you so much for your insightful presentation and for showing us that the religion was the elephant in the living room. I wonder if you could tell us how, uh, when you do get your religious group together and you are able to come to an understanding, how you will be able to uh, prevent groups like Hamas and the more violent ones from still going on and doing their own agenda? Well, I didn't say religion was the elephant in the living room. I said the Middle East conflict was the elephant in the living room when groups want to come to dialogue interreligiously. But as I said earlier, <clears throat> we're not going to, I don't think it's possible to completely eliminate the abuse of religion. Obviously, there are things you can do to dry up the swamp. As I indicated, religious extremism feeds off alienation. The alienation can be economic deprivation. It can be political marginalization. There are various factors, especially in the Arab Muslim world, it's much more problematic because there's a sense of great historic injustice. You hear Arabs even talking of the Crusades as if they just happened yesterday, Arab Muslims. There's a sense that they have been humiliated and that therefore is need, as I indicated, in order to be able to deal with this very often to demonize the other. So one of the most important things for us to do is to try to address these economic, political, and social issues, to try our best to make those communities that may feel more marginal welcome in our societies, 
to engage them and not to take an attitude that simply because maybe they'll take us for a ride, then we don't want to have anything to do with them. That is counterproductive. By reaching out, you may be able to have an impact. I am a firm believer in the power of the human encounter. But yet, in the end of the day, we have to be honest and we have to be realistic and recognize that there are plenty of people we're not going to change. And today, people have the power. People are not more evil today than they were in the past. But people today have the power to do evil that they never had in the past due to the accessibility of technology. And therefore, we need to be secure. Therefore, we need to make sure there's effective law enforcement. We need to make sure that there are effective intelligence services and activities. And we need to make sure that we spend as plenty of resources on prevention rather than simply cure. But my main point is that today, the impression one gets, and in fact it's compounded, is that the religions are in the hands of the extremists. Let me give you an example. I was in Indonesia a few months ago. And I, it was actually a conference organized by the Habibi Institute, the former president of Indonesia. And I was speaking on Judaism, religion, and peace. And when I had finished, one of the people came up and said, why don't we hear more rabbis like you? Why, don't we, why doesn't our press report on these wonderful ideas that you're talking about? Why do we only hear about Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, who says that Arabs' heads should be dashed out on the rocks? Why do we hear about Rabbi Ginsburg? I mean, this is a marginal individual. I was amazed that they'd ever even heard of who he was. Rabbi Ginsburg, who has a yeshiva, a seminary, near Shechem, near Nablus, who says the little finger of a Jew is worth more than any Gentile. Now, unfortunately, these comments were true. But they're the only ones they hear about. And all the moderate voices are not getting the exposure. And I find very often there's almost a mirror image within our communities here. Everybody knows about the extremists, but the moderate voices are not getting the proper exposure. If I say to people, generally speaking, do you know what is the largest Muslim community in America? Most people don't know. It's black Islam. If I say, who do you think leads black Islam? People say Farrakhan. That's rubbish. Farrakhan isn't even a Muslim, not recognized as a Muslim. And he represents maybe within those that came out of the um, Elijah Muhammad uh, in, uh, context, less than 10%. 90% are led by W.D. Muhammad, who lives in Calumet City near Chicago, who is a modest and peace-loving individual, who has been twice to Israel as the guest of the State of Israel, who is eager for cooperation, has condemned violence and terrorism time again, and nobody knows about it. Why? Well, partially because if you want to sell newspapers and you want to get media rating, then you want something sensationalist, you don't want something positive. So I can't, don't want to blame the media entirely for it. But it's part of the problem. And therefore, if we want to really create different perceptions, we need to work harder at giving those kind of voices greater exposure. And the more we strengthen them, and the more we respect them, and the more we therefore give, empower them, the more we can neutralize those elements within Hamas and Islamic Jihad and similar elements, which will remain there. But if we can raise the power of the moderate voices, and if political authority takes them more seriously and gives them the profile, then we can reduce the power of it. You can see exactly what's happening at the Gaza at the moment. If the Palestinian Authority gets stronger, Hamas will get weaker. Hamas only gets stronger when the Palestinian Authority can't deliver it. That's why it behoves Israel, the United States, and the Quartet do their best to strengthen Abu Mazen and strengthen the Palestinian Authority. Otherwise, in the end, we'll have no one left to talk to but Hamas. And if we can ever, you know, sometimes it's amazing what metaphorses, metamorphoses people go through. But in order to get to that stage, we'd have to go through, unfortunately, a great deal of bloodshed and a great deal of more pain. And I think we can avoid it if we know how to strengthen the moderate voice. Uh, I was very impressed by uh, your paradigm of the inward spiral leading to the insular attitude of religion. And I think about America, uh, us being a non-religious state, we just had a bit of a racial riot in New Orleans based on the fact that there was a challenge of identity. And it's been American policy to try to build countries, Afghanistan, Iraq, as non-religious states. The inward spiraling seems that it causes a, a great deal of uh, 
it becomes a life and death inward spiraling when there are religious states. And I wonder if the foundation for the intensity of the conflicts that we have are the fact that what we're discussing are religious states. When Indonesia was the safest country, what was a safe Muslim country, it was because it was a moderate Muslim country. It stayed away from identifying itself as an Islamic country. Well, I'm not sure that there's one model because um, the American model is a very impressive model and has a lot to teach. But there are European countries where you have institutional religions and in fact are defined by their religions, especially for example Norway, which in itself doesn't mean that religion is problematic. It has more to do, there was a great a Jewish scholar uh, who passed away a few years ago in Israel by the name of Professor Yishayahu Leibovitch. And one of his comments, which I'm going to praise you, was that theology is influenced more by sociology and politics than the other way around. And that is a position I share. In other words, everything good can be abused. Our uh, sexuality, our eating, our drinking, all of these things can be abused and used in a negative way. So can identity and so can the religious dimension. The, uh, I don't think that the degree to which religion institutionally is part of a society is ne necessarily a, an indication that it's going to be abused. And I think there are plenty of examples where it's different. However, I would agree with you that it is a dangerous temptation for abuse. And uh, I would agree that we are on safer ground where there is a separation of religion and state, of church and state, which doesn't, of course, in any way detract from my other arguments. But I reminded you know, there's a, a wonderful one, the magnum opus of the 11th century Jewish philosopher Yehuda Halevi from Spain is a work called the Kuzari, the King of the Khazars, and is a dialogue between a rabbi and a king. Um, in fact, the subtitle of the book is An Apology for a Despised Religion, so you can understand where he's coming from. And uh, in this discussion in which the rabbi persuades the king that Judaism is the right way, there are two occasions when the rabbi has no answer. And one is when the rabbi says to the king, you know, we Jews, we're not like the Christians and the Muslims. Christians, they talk about love, and the Muslims, they talk about justice. But look how they kill and pillage and plunder and all the terrible things they do. We Jews, we don't do that sort of thing. No, of course you don't, says the king. You don't have the power to do that sort of thing. Let's see how you behave when you have the power. Now, that's a very important insight. I think it is, and therefore, there is an element of, of truth in what you're saying, it is the abuse of power when wedded to religion that is the problem. But the place of religion within an institutional context doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be party to the abuse of power. But its presence as part of that structure certainly is a dangerous temptation. We'll have our last question here. I was concerned about the possible um, strengthening of Hamas by telling them they cannot be part of the elections in Palestine, the alienation that they would feel. Yeah, I think I'm concerned too. I think probably that would only strengthen them and give them more power. It's a very difficult situation though to be in because in some way you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. And therefore, the, I would say, and I'm not a political authority, therefore you must just take my opinions with the, uh, the degree of skepticism that they deserve or do not deserve. But that's all the more reason of why I say that I think it's very important for America and for Israel and for Europe and Russia and the United Nations, but especially for America and Israel, to strengthen the hands of the Palestinian Authority so that Hamas can go to the elections, <clears throat> but so that the Palestinian population can see that the Palestinian Authority can deliver. If they see that the Palestinian can deliver, they will be less inclined to go to Hamas. Hamas's popularity has basically been in the f when the Palestinian Authority is weak, when it can't pay salaries, when it can't develop infrastructure, when it's not providing any security, then Hamas gets stronger. When the Palestinian Authority is proving itself, Hamas gets weaker. Thank you very much.